Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along um, to the latest uh, Work Matters event. This is a series that we've been running uh, at the Work Foundation through the course of, of 2022, uh, focused on uh, the labour market and timed around the latest data coming out from the ONS to tell us what's going on uh, in relation uh, to the jobs market in the UK. My name is Ben Harrison. I'm I'm director uh, here at the Work Foundation, uh, which is a policy think tank, uh, which is part of Lancaster University. For those that you, of you that don't know us, uh, the Work Foundation has got a long and, and storied history stretching all the way back to uh, 1918 and the Industrial Society. And throughout the past century, in our various guises, we've consistently been committed to supporting everyone to access well-paid, secure employment. And our current work programme is really focused on job insecurity, uh, particularly for those who face structural disadvantage within the labour market. Now, since the last time we ran one of these events, um, clearly an awful lot has happened. Uh, the last one was in the early summer. Since then, we've got a new prime minister, uh, a new government, uh, with a, an explicit new uh, mission around driving growth in the economy. Um, I think everyone uh, on the call would accept that it's been a decidedly rocky start for the new administration. But what we want to focus on today is what kind of labour market has Liz Truss inherited and what are the key challenges uh, that it presents to getting growth going? Um, and do we feel like the government's priorities that have been outlined so far are the right ones in this context? To help us do this, I'm delighted that we're going to be joined uh, by a fantastic panel of contributors today. Unfortunately, economist Linda Yo has been called away uh, this afternoon at late notice, but we managed to squeeze in some pre-recorded reflections with Linda this morning before her flight. So we're going to get um, started with those in just a second. But on the call this afternoon, we also have Kate Shoesmith, who's the Deputy Chief Executive of the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, independent policy expert on mental health, social security and employment, Tom Pollard, and Head of Research here at the Work Foundation, Melanie Wilkes. Before we get initial reflections from the panel, I do just want to set the scene a little bit on the latest data from this morning. Um, and just to say, remember, I'll be looking to bring in your questions to the wider discussion once we've heard from all of our panelists. So if you do have questions as we go through, please put them in the Q&A tab in Zoom, not, not the general chat, but the Q&A tab, and I will keep an eye on that as we go. So in terms of the data, what have we seen today? Well, the UK employment rate dropped slightly uh, and remains lower than before the pandemic. Um, we, but at the same time, we have seen the lowest unemployment rate since 1974, uh, with unemployment decreasing by 0.3 percentage points on the quarter. But really crucially, I think, in amongst all of this, and this will be a big talking point through the rest of the event today, I think, economic inactivity continues to grow. Um, and it's increased by 0.6 percentage points, um, up to 21.7%. And this is particularly relevant, I think, uh, in the context of the high number of vacancies that we still see uh, in the economy. So they've dropped slightly, but we still have 1.2 million uh, unfilled vacancies across the economy. The increase in economic inactivity seems to be being driven by people who are in long, uh, who, are, who are suffering from long-term sickness or ill health, as well as a chunk of that being uh, younger people, uh, uh, presumably uh, opting to remain in uh, education. Of course, all of this is also taking place against the backdrop of high inflation and a cost of living crisis. So we can also take a look at what it means um, for wages. And real pay fell by 2.9%, and that represents one of the largest falls since 2001. The regular pay growth that we have seen is being driven by the private sector, uh, with the public sector lagging quite away behind the private sector, just 2.2%. So, all of which means we're seeing employment falling, inactivity rising, and pay failing to keep pace with inflation. So to try and understand this data a little bit further, as I mentioned before, I managed to speak with economist Linda Yo this morning, and I asked her for her overall reflections on what's going on within the labour market right now. And hopefully, if the technology works, we're going to get her up on the screen just now to let you know. The economy um, is slowing and has slowed dramatically. And this is because we are in a cost of living crisis. So the labor market stats today essentially show that unemployment is a lagging indicator. So for instance, once the economy starts to 
contract. The Chancellor has actually said he thinks the economy is in recession now, which is consistent with the Bank of England forecast of 15 months of recession starting in this quarter, the last three months of the year. But firms hang on to workers until they're um, sure of what their budgets and plans look like. And that tends to be why unemployment doesn't rise when the economy starts to contract, but it lags. So today's figures actually show that unemployment dropped um, to three and a half percent, which is actually the lowest level since 1974. Now, anytime I see a reference to the 1970s, I start to get extremely worried because that was the pattern. Uh, unemployment rose sharply. Three million people were out of work um, as a result of the energy uh, shocks, uh, price shocks in the 1970s. But you can also see in today's labor market statistics some of the slowing that I'm describing. So vacancies, although still at a high level, have actually now declined for three consecutive quarters. Employment is also down. And what this is showing is that there is a pullback uh, of firms as they try and work out how they're going to manage um, this recession. And then just finally, I think the, you know, because inflation is so high, even though uh, wage growth figures over the year, um, you know, was was pretty good, you know, higher than um, perhaps what we'd seen in previous periods, um, including bonuses up 6%, um, excluding uh, total, uh, so excluding bonuses, um, you know, a bit less than that, 5.4%. But once you take into account inflation, that's actually a decline in the money that people are taking home. And that's extremely worrying. So the about two and a half percent earnings are actually down in real terms. That's slightly better than the record three percent we had in the previous release. But that to me is why it's extremely worrying for disposable incomes for people as unemployment looms uh, because of the recession and real wages are not keeping up uh, with the increases of cost of living. So unemployment just finally is projected by the Bank of England to rise up to about 5% next year. Now, that is uh, lower than what it was um, in the early 80s recession that followed from the 1970s energy price shocks. Um, and I think we would all hope um, that that forecast is right. Having heard from Linda there, we can clearly see that there's a number of global headwinds facing um, the UK um, and, and also a kind of distinct set of issues um, uh, within the UK labour market itself. I'd now like to bring in Kate to provide another perspective on these challenges. Um, we heard from Linda there, Kate, there on the prospect of recession uh, and that employers uh, are already going to be thinking about what this potential slowdown means for them. It would be great to get your reflections on the data today, but also potentially what employers and, 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 recruit, and the recruitment sector generally is thinking about the future. Thanks very much, Ben. And it's really good to, to be here and to, to join Work Foundation colleagues and others. Um, so, so thank you for the invitation. And it's, um, and it's obviously very timely given we had the ONS stats out um, just this morning. To, to give a little bit of context, um, I'm from an organisation called the Recruitment and Employment Confederation. We're the professional membership body for the UK recruitment industry. Um, any given day, there are about 1 million people that work via an agency on a freelance contract or temporary basis uh, via one of our members. And also in the last year, um, recruiters have helped 1 million people find a new permanent job. Linda's comments to me um, really underline the point of, could we be facing a situation where we are in recession or about to go into recession, depending on which economic viewpoint you um, you take, um, and also have labour market shortages at the same time, which traditionally, when we have recessions, we, we do see that um, unemployment rates shoot up. And, and as Linda was saying, there's the, the, it is a lagging indicator in some regards. Um, but I do think that there's a possibility that that's exactly the situation we will be facing. We've just undertaken a piece of economic modelling, which has sought to really understand the labour and skill shortages, which we've seen the press talk about for quite some time. We first started to report on recruitment data as we came out of um, lockdowns in March 2021 which showed that recruitment activity was shooting up um, for both permanent and temporary roles um, and across all sectors and all geographies of the UK. 
we were seeing that there was that um, pent up demand from employers after the lockdowns from the pandemic, where they were desperate to hire. And many employers will still say to us that the only way that they have of growing their businesses is by recruiting more people. Um, so they've tried all the other levers. They just need more people. Now, we've been talking about labor and skill shortages for a very, very long time. In the 25 years that the Recruitment and Employment Confederation has conducted Report on Jobs, which is our monthly tracking survey of recruitment activity, we do that with KPMG and with SP Global. Um, the sharpest um, and highest rate of candidate availability is what we've seen. So the supply of people to do the jobs available has been the highest we've ever seen in 25 years um, following the pandemic. And there was multiple reasons for that, but it was exacerbating that long term problem that we've all been speaking about around labour and skills shortages. And we costed it out and found that if we continued to not do anything, to impact labour and skill shortages, the demand would, would continue to increase and that would cost our economy by 2024 anywhere between 30 and 39 billion pounds per year. So if you look at that, that's the same as the annual defence budget. It's the cost of two Elizabeth lines. Um, it, it's a significant amount of money. Employers are saying to us that they have to recruit if they want to grow their businesses. And so for us, it's a case of what is it we can do to really start to address some of this. And we think the responsibility for this, it lies with government. And we perhaps will explore that in some of the Q&A um, in just a moment. Um, but also there's there's roles here for business. So, so I'll leave my introductory remarks there if I may, Ben, and then we can come back to some of this perhaps in the Q&A. Brilliant, thank, thank you, Kate. And, and I get a sense there, even just from the first couple of minutes there, of a, of a kind of growing impatience really for us to be able to kind of start cracking on with some of this. And we'll certainly get into that. In, in the course of the conversation. But I'm going to just ask you to, to, to turn off your screen and mute for now, and I'll turn to my colleague, Mel Wilkes, who's the head of research here uh, at the Work Foundation, and get your reflections, Mel, on today's data and, and the wider labour market picture. Thanks, Ben. Well, as you mentioned, there's been a continued rise in inactivity driven by ill health in the, in the data release this morning. And of course, while it's important that people who aren't well enough to work can take time away from the labour market, a growing number of working age adults are experiencing a long term health condition or are disabled and it's crucial that we look at any working patterns or employment practices that might be contributing to people who want to work not being able to stay in their jobs through a change in their physical or mental health. The other thing that both Kate um, and uh, Linda have touched on uh, as well as the kind of wider headlines today is this um, the, the, is unemployment reaching record lows um, but there, there is a need to look beyond those headlines um, at the kinds of work that people are doing uh, as, as we've seen through our own analysis here at the work foundation uh, looking at the last 20 years of, of labor force survey data we've seen that insecure work is a kind of core characteristic of, of the uk economy and it currently affects 6.2 million people across the country in some sectors like hospitality, services and agriculture, it's as many as one in three workers who are in severely insecure work. Despite increases in the minimum wage, we still have a low pay problem. And while vacancies are high and employment is low, large numbers of people are reporting that they aren't working the hours that they want to, or they're in their temporary contract when they prefer to be in permanent work. This kind of insecurity doesn't just affect people in, on a day-to-day -day basis, making it difficult to budget or get by, particularly in the cost of living crisis. But we know that it can have long-term impacts too on long-term financial security, long-term career trajectories and wider health and well-being. As we've just been hearing from both Linda and Kate, we might be about to enter a recession. And we're concerned that with many employers struggling with rising operating con costs and in this kind of broader economic context, the use of insecure and casual pre-contracts could start to rise. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mal. A really useful reminder that actually um, we should also be thinking about the kinds of jobs that are already in the economy and uh, and the kinds of working conditions that people are experiencing. We'll definitely get into a little bit more of that as we get into, into the conversation as well. Before we do that, though, Tom, I'd like to bring you in, Tom Pollard. Uh, and alongside your overall perspective on these figures, Tom, it would be great, uh, given your experience, to get your perspective specifically around this uh, notion of inactivity that we're seeing in the labour market and, and, and the kind of links to ill health. Yeah, so um, hi everyone. As been implied there, a lot of my work's been about the kind of interaction of uh, disability and health and particularly mental health uh, and how those things are interacting with employment, unemployment, um, social security benefits. So the thing that's obviously kind of screaming out to me at the moment from the labour market figures is the growing number of people who are economically inactive and they're saying that poor health is the primary reason for that. So it's been another increase of around 170,000 people since the last update just three months ago um, and we're up to 2.5 almost 2.5 million people now um, after hovering around sort of 2 million figure for the few years running up to the pandemic so in terms of what's driving this um, I've been doing some digging on this but actually I'd really recommend having a look at a John Byrne Murdoch piece from the FT on Friday um which did some great analysis around the kind of conditions health conditions that are driving this growth in economic inactivity um it seems to be primarily down to chronic pain which is a really broad uh, category but may imply something to do with nhs backlogs and things like operations people having issues around mobility and pain related to that mental health is other huge area of growth and then possibly long COVID. it's it, it's not in there as a uh, as a kind of separate category, but some of the data and some of the other um, research in this space seems to imply that long COVID may be playing a part. Um, but critically, there's been a huge growth in the number of people who are reporting or citing multiple health conditions, a mixture of physical and health conditions, which have been actually been a downward trend prior to the pandemic. And so I think we need to recognise how complex a task it's going to be to support people who are in that situation um, back into the workplace. I think a lot of this poor health will be a direct consequence of the pandemic. But actually, I think the picture is going to be more complex than that. I think there'll be people, for example, who were working despite poor health prior to the pandemic, fell out of a supportive workplace and have struggled to find a new role that's going to be accommodating to their needs. So I think that there's a whole lot going on under the surface here that we're only just kind of scratching at the moment. Um, we'll move on to this, I'm sure, in the, in the discussion today, but huge implications for government around... You know, rising social security costs, um, needing to rethink employment support for people with health conditions and disabilities, seeing this as a cross-government task rather than just a BWP task, and also thinking about what are the conditions that might support someone who's in this position to move towards work. And I'd suggest that's about stability and security. Uh, in the past, the way the benefit system has operated is to kind of push people and to use precarity as a kind of tool of, uh, to turn, try and encourage people towards work. And then, as has been touched on already, implications for employers, I think thinking about how to fill vacancies by supporting people with significant health needs, so flexible working, job carving, working with uh, specialist employment support schemes. And then, you know, how do you support your new and existing employees to stay well so we're not, so we're not seeing more people moving out of the workplace due to poor health? So I think there's a lot to think about in this space. Thanks, Tom. That, that's great. Uh, if I could just invite all of our panellists now to turn their cameras on, um, uh, we can get into the more open um, section of the event. Uh, it'd be great to get some questions from, from those of you uh, who are watching the event today. Um, as you've just seen a little pop up in the chat. If you could leave them in the Q&A um, panel, that'd be great. And I'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, in the meantime, I wonder if we might just start the conversation by sticking with this issue of, of economic inactivity. Uh, and maybe I'll turn to you first, Mel. Um, what, what would you say to people who, 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 would, who might suggest that actually there's always been an element of economic inactivity in, in the UK labour market? This isn't necessarily something new and, and and whether actually we should be worried about it or, or, or what about the current set of circumstances mean that it is something we should be concerned about? Sure, I mean that's a good question but inactivity isn't necessarily in and of itself a bad thing. Under the umbrella of inactivity there are, there are quite a few things um, including people who are studying full-time, people who've retired uh, before they kind of reached 64-65, um, people who uh, need to stay at home to uh, care for a family member or a full-time stay-at-home mum or dad. 
Um, and it's true that looking historically, uh, the trend around inactivity is, is quite stable. And, and when we've got kind of relatively low levels of inactivity compared to where they were uh, harking back to the 1970s as, as Linda was earlier on. Um, however, we have seen a real change uh, over the course of the last couple of years as, as Tom's just been talking about. And, and some of that is really quite worrying. So we've seen um, a rise in inactivity related to ill health as we've been talking about. So people saying that they've had to stop work um, due to either short-term but largely a long-term uh, health condition. Um, and we've also seen a rise in people over 50 stopping work. And the concerning thing about that is the data seems to suggest that people are stopping work before they'd originally planned to. Uh, they're high flows of inactivity uh, compared to the years before the pandemic. And particularly in the context of the cost of living crisis, that suggests that we've got a few people who have left the market, the left, left the labour market um, to retire and perhaps may not have enough money to get by day to day as the price of energy bills and kind of day to day living costs rise. Uh, so we do need to think a bit um, about the types of support uh, and uh, Tom's just touched on a few really important examples there that that uh, could be best targeted to groups of people who are currently out of work but might want to return to work um, or need to return to work given financial pressures with the right support. Yeah. And I just just building on that, then, Kate, you mentioned in your remarks that you, you sort of see this really as a, as a challenge for, for government, but also for uh, employers themselves. And we've had a question from uh, from one of our audience members around so what kinds of cross government schemes can you imagine? And, and that's something which Tom sort of alluded to as well. Do you maybe want to just say a little bit about what you might envisage, both from the kind of governmental side, but also it'd be interesting to see what, what you think around the employer side on this as well? Absolutely. Um, so, so one of the things pre um, pre the ONS stats coming out, we can often hear from recruiters of what they they feel is happening in the jobs market, and they'll get an impression from the clients they're hiring for, so the businesses that they they recruit for, but also the candidates they're placing and um, and their and what they're looking for in terms of um, jobs. And I would say by the middle of last year we were getting this really strong impression that people were opting out of the labour market and uh, had reassessed their priorities. Um, the pandemic had caused a number of us to, to rethink all of the things that we had to do. Uh, we were particularly getting stories of there being this squeeze generation where you have childcare responsibilities on the one hand, you also might have um, caring responsibilities for other members of the family, particularly elderly parents, something like that. And the, the, the pressure of working, it, having, to, having to deliver that care um being the expectations on you um throughout the pandemic um plus a sense of if your employer hadn't necessarily really supported you um during that time the the classic example of this was um a sense from some people that in the nhs that they they had worked so hard during that time and they couldn't uh, flex their shifts necessarily they had to do everything they had to do all those shifts they had to take on all of those additional responsibilities that many of us had outside of um, work in terms of care in terms of homeschooling everything that that, that went on um, and burnout was just this this factor so we were we were hearing this um, before it started to appear in the data so so Mel's right there's a sense of inactivity in one sense when it's a choice isn't bad I think one of the things though that we're feeling is that people feel they've had no choice to do this. It is something that they've done, they've chosen to do this. However, it's it's because something has to give. And, and that's where that collaboration piece becomes all, the, all important. So um, first of all, I, I've, I've mentioned one of the key things and, and it was mentioned in our introductory remarks as well, is that what, what is the employer offering those people that are already in work or and could potentially be staying in work? How are they supporting them best? Now, it might be the culture around that business. It might be the flexible working offer that is available to them. I, there, there is a there is a real sense for me that people do not necessarily work in temporary jobs because they are forced to they work in those jobs because it's the only way they can get flexibility. So that has to be recognized by more and more employers about why that the, there's a, um, a parity there and that people are making those trade-offs between flexibility and possibly pay because that's what they have to do. So employers need to think about the offer. They need to think about 
how they're recruiting, how they're retaining staff, what are they doing? Bus businesses need support from government in facilitating some of that. So it's a case for what what does uh, what does day one flexibility look like? Is there is there something that government can do to say to employers, actually, you should be doing this from the off? Uh, because it is the way we're all choosing to work. So that, that's one part of it. That collaboration is all important. If we know where the skills shortages and gaps are, which we do from our jobs market data, and I said we, you know, we've been collecting this data for a long time, as of many industries, that evidence sits across employers needs to go into government, needs to feed into our education programs. It needs to make sure that it's working in concert with what DWP are offering in terms of um, work support and retraining. And then it also needs to work in concert with um, the Department for Health. So all of those things, those connectors, I often feel like some of us on the outside, we're, we're making those connections for government. You've got DHSC thinking on the one terms about um, NHS waiting lists. There's a clear crossover with what that's doing to DWP unemployment figures and inactivity numbers. So bringing those together. Bayes has responsibility for how you're incentivizing employers to invest in capital into investing in their workforces. Department for Education is there responsible for training and skills, bring the lot together. We're doing, we're making some of those connections for ourselves, but if you bring it together into a coherent strategy that businesses can buy into and see the vision for, I, th I think we could be further ahead. There's an awful lot that, um, and, I, and I know we'll come onto this, there's, there's questions around what do other countries do that we can learn from? And, and I think there are examples we have. That's really helpful, Kate. And, and Tom, I saw you nodding uh, along to quite a bit of what Kate was saying there. And obviously it picks up on some of your reflections on the need for this to be cross-departmental within government. I think I'm right in saying that you've spent a little bit of time actually within, within the DWP and kind of can, can maybe relate to that experience. Uh, how would you recommend or, or how do you envisage government successfully bringing together some of these silos that currently exist? Because we've sort of, I guess we've known about this for quite a long period of time, but in the end, it will take, you know, a real political will within government to, to start doing some of that, won't it? Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's difficult because I think these problems for a long time have been seen in isolation by different departments, right? The, the, the people get there. The health support from the NHS and they get their employment support from DWP. But what you're seeing with this group, group of people who are kind of out of work for quite long periods of time with multiple health conditions and probably a lot of other things going on as well, probably, you know, quite possibly issues around their housing, possibly issues around like substance use. Like I work part time in NHS mental health services and it's very rare that kind of these problems fall into kind of neat you know delineated categories it, there's a lot of kind of blur between these different issues and those sort of complex problems can't be addressed by one government department sort of stepping in and saying we've got a scheme to fix this and if i'm honest my reflection on my time at dwp was that's that's the problem is that they see people as benefit claimants and their response is to try to move them off of benefits and into work. And they do that through employability schemes, which is fine for people who have fallen out of work for a brief period of time because, because their job, you know, stopped, you know, or, or because they moved location in the country or, you know, some, something that's a relatively simple issue. But when there's these kind of complex problems underlying unemployment, it, on the whole, those kind of schemes just don't make a dent. Um, and I think particularly when we're thinking about in the wake of the pandemic, I think there's something really interesting what Kate was saying there. I mean, I, I think we need to understand the pandemic as kind of a, you know, practical, social, emotional, psychological rupture, right? It, it was a, a big event. And although in some ways it can feel day to day now, like life has returned to come something, something near normal, I think for a lot of people, it was a kind of watershed moment or, or extended watershed moment. And people did reevaluate their priorities, but also probably struggled to return to life as normal. So, you know, we get this impression that life's returned to normal. But I think for a lot of people, maybe because the work they used to do isn't now available or, or the particular job they used to do isn't now available. I think people who were kind of just about getting by with health conditions as part of the picture have probably really struggled to return to life, life as normal. And, and, and especially people who were kind of, more at risk because of the pandemic and and so for them it would have been a much more profound psychological experience than for some of us so i worry a bit that we haven't really done the healing we need to do as as, as a country around this stuff and a lot of the talk post-pandemic was you know get back to the office you know stop skiving at home 
And I think it's it's so far wider the mark of the kind of discussion we need about about work and about flexibility and about how we you know accommodate and support people. And I feel like we really missed a trick in that post pandemic period of having a kind of national conversation about what what work could look like in the in the wake of that experience. And instead, we've kind of just tried to go back to business as normal. And th this is where it's left us. Absolutely, Tom. And just, just while you have the floor, we do also have a question around uh, examples from other countries around how people with disabilities in particular could be supported better. I suppose that's a part of this, isn't it, in terms of that, that bigger conversation that you're saying that we, we could have we could have had. Are there examples that, that you might that you might give in that regard briefly? So the every kind of approach I've sort of heard people talk about has its pros and cons, but there are there are some systems that are much more specific about like what sort of work could you do? And is that work actually available here? So making it more of a real world assessment of, of kind of people's ability to work and making it much more specifically focused on, here's a type of job you could do and we'll train you to do it. And you know that, that has its pros and cons that I think in general, the systems that, that can incorporate people's healthcare, people's social care, um, taking account of people's kind of wider social and economic circumstances, and building a package of support and certainly what I've recommended around around this when I've written on kind of what a future model of this might look like I've said first of all take it take it out of DWP world and make it something that kind of ties together an existing ecosystem of support that exists locally so people will use the health service people will use local charities and local community services start there where people have trust and relationships and think about how you can better support incorporate employment as an objective into those ecosystems rather than trying to sort of you know parachute in from whitehall with a dwp scheme that you know people don't trust and people don't relate to and people you know don't don't have a tangible connection to so my my sort of key message on this always is kind of start start where people are at and think about how you can build from the bottom up um, and that needs to work across a whole bunch of systems and services that people are plugged into. Ben, do you mind if I just... Um, of we, course, we, Kate, we, go for it. We, to, to Tom's point, is um, we've been working with um, Maximus on the restart scheme. And and absolutely, so, so one, great that there's that um, sense of um, a, a government budget and initiative that is there to support people that are that little bit further away from the the jobs market into work and and how do you do that um what we found and it's similar to to how um to our experiences of kickstart which we were also involved in with a number of our members businesses got it they absolutely you know we're in we're in a situation where we have labor and skill shortages and i'm banging on about it all the time and so I said yeah absolutely we can support this we we see the benefit of of working with people that are perhaps from different communities bringing in new types of workers um people that are seeking work the first problem we had on both schemes is that we were the outreach was not necessarily tailored to the, the situation of those individuals, those job seekers' lives, were they even job seekers? Were they job ready? And the huge amount of effort we've put in into, into really attracting people to those roles. And I think I think you're spot on, Tom, is that that responsibility, they're not necessarily walking into a job centre. They're not ready for some of this. That There's so much we should be learning and evaluating from schemes like this before we just commit more money to it again to think that's what's going to solve the problem and, and I and I think we we just we can see it so, so I totally agree with what Tom's saying it's just a case of how do we we need we need to make sure that there's that active listening to, to our experiences on the ground because there's no point repeating this over and over again with thinking that the next scheme is going to be the thing that uh, tackles worklessness it's not going to without the buy-in of what's actually happening on the ground. That's really interesting, Kate. Mel, just, just to come to you on this, because I could see you nodding there, should, should we be a bit encouraged that, that the Labour Party at their conference sort of made quite a big play around this, this, this area? And obviously John Ashworth sort of announcing that Labour would lead the development of, of a new employment service that was locally based, and I suppose is, is at least notionally picking up on some of the things that we've just heard from, from Tom and Kate. Absolutely, yeah. And I, and I mean, I know this is something that, that, that Tom has talked about in the past, and certainly for us at the Work Foundation, we've been calling for employment support that is tailored to individuals and that joins up with the other kind of services that people are using, as, as Tom's just described. So we've talked about 
using there's the local skills improvement plans that have been um, developed through the kind of new skills bill they're an opportunity to bring together a range of different bodies working locally local government um, your further education systems colleges as well as dwp working locally um, and the kinds of organizations that people just trust and actually use day to day and would willingly go to um, for support uh, without feeling kind of pressured to. Um, so that that kind of approach does feel very promising. Um, I think more the other thing that's really promising about Labour kind of making moves on this now is we do need to be having these conversations about employment support. Coming back to what Linda said at the start of this, we may be about to enter a recession. So we're having these conversations, you know, we're, we're acutely aware that there are some real issues in employment support at the moment, um, that a system which kind of kind of in some cases is known for kind of pressurizing people and leading people to feel um, required to apply for sort of any job regardless of whether it feels right for them isn't working for employers and it's not working for for people who are out of work either so we do need to do that listening that you've been talking about Kate taking stock and thinking about clearly we know we know what worked and what didn't from the from the last kind of larger scale employment support programs like the work program which was reasonably effective for people that were in those kind of more simple situations that Tom described earlier on, but really was ineffective for anyone that had a more complex situation going on in their life. Um, if we're about to face uh, an increase in unemployment, then we're going to need to ramp up um, investment in employment support. And so I think now's a really good time to be asking quite fundamental questions about who should deliver it? Should it come through DWP? What is the role of trusted organisations like charities, uh, like um, you know, third sector prov providers um, who can work together with local authorities um, to provide support that is based on individuals' kind of needs and aspirations? Fantastic. I'm um, just taking stock of some of the questions. We've now got an awful lot of questions in the Q&A um, panel, which is fantastic. Thank you for those. And obviously do keep, keep them coming in. I'm going to try and get through as many as we can. We've got one from uh, Margaret Beals, who is the Director of Labour Market Enforcement, um, around how UK and activity levels compare with elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and we've done a little bit of digging uh, through uh, the, as the event has been going on. And, and it appears that uh, they're, they're broadly in line with the OECD. They're, they're a little bit below the OECD average, but in terms of other sort of similar economies within the OECD, the UK at the moment currently has sort of similar levels of inactivity. And so I guess it's more, as we've been talking about this morning, the kind of drivers of that inactivity, why we're seeing what we're seeing, and in the context of uh, high levels of, uh, of vacancies as well. One common uh, area coming up through a few questions is specifically around skills. And I know we've touched upon that a little bit um, uh, in some of the remarks we've heard so far. But Kate, if I could maybe just come back to you on this. One question we've got here is, is whether sort of skills is actually playing a, a, a lesser role than perhaps it has in the past around, uh, around shortages. Is that the case or is, or is it actually just a kind of compounding factor? And, and what would you like to see happen in the skills space over the course of the rest of this parliament? There's definitely skill shortages. And um, and what we've seen is that we're now in a situation where we've got labour and skill shortages. So um, my, my reflections on looking at um, our, our jobs data is that whereas I'd say pre-pandemic and, and probably going back for some time, you could be very specific about the areas where there were skill shortages. If I give, if I give an example, um, if I look at around the IT, the technology, the computing sector, I, I would look at that data and, uh, and I'd see where, what are recruiters saying are particularly hard skills to recruit for. And they would, they would put things down about um, specific IT programming skills. So 10 years ago, they would say C++, then it would move on and they would talk about Java programming and then there were lots of other programs I've literally I have you know totally outside of my comfort zone Ruby I remember this thing called Ruby on Rails would appear and I was like okay as long as programmers know what this is what's changed and the same applies in in some of the other sectors particularly STEM sectors if I if I look at this what has changed is it feels like the 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 data is is less granular in some ways. So, for instance, when you ask recruiters to express where there are particular shortages uh, for key roles, rather than them saying specifics within IT or specifics within engineering, they'll just say IT programming overall. We need developers. We need more developers. We simply don't have the quantity to fill the jobs. Same goes with engineering. 
I just need engineers. I need them at all levels. I need them in all different kinds. So whether it's mechanical, it's chemical, it's design, everything. So it feels like it's um, wider than perhaps where we used to where we used to list specific skills. Um, you just have to look at um, if I take because I know one of the questions as mentioned particularly if I if I take health medical care now. Again, for as long as I've worked at the REC, I've talked about there being uh, higher numbers of vacancies in um, medical care services and they're still not being filled. And, you know, we saw the report from the Skills for Care um, group this morning about actually the declining numbers of people coming forward for that. Um, it's just been exacerbated by the pandemic in a lot of these areas so there's there's always been problems of finding people for some of these sectors in very particular niche areas but it feels like that's broadened out a bit and part of that has been um to do with there there is a small brexit impact we can definitely see that to some extent so i'll, I'll choose another sector the um uh, our driver recruiters will say that there are a number of hgv drivers that went home at the start of the pandemic, who are European, who went home at the start of the pandemic and haven't returned. So we knew we had a shortage of HDV drivers in this country. We've talked about that for a very long time. We had a small Brexit impact, We had, but it was the pandemic. They, they left, they're not coming back. So what do we do about some of that? The main problem though we've had is that we've got um, the rising levels of inactivity where we've seen people drop out of the jobs market that's what's caused us that that disconnect and that's what's caused us this big this that's why it feels so important right now um that we and that and that's why we keep talking about labor and skill shortages it's it's a it is a different environment um and why if we are going into recession um and what what's happening around the economy some people will be reviewing their um, circumstances because of the cost of living. They'll be thinking, do I need to come back into work? Do I need to pick up hours here and there? What do I need to do? For some people, it's just not an option still. So I don't think that will fully address the labour shortages we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And on, on skills as, as well, Mel, to, to bring you in here, as, as sort of Kate was saying around some of the challenges we, we sort of know we've got, I know you engage in research over the course of the last couple of years, looking at some of the initiatives that the government has launched uh, over, over the last couple of years around Prime Minister's Lifetime Skills Guarantee, et cetera, trying to kind of shift some of the wider culture, I suppose, when it comes to adult learning and adult, and adult skills, where we know we lag behind other OECD countries. Are there, are there sort of interventions that, that you think this government could make, perhaps as part of its wider push for growth? That build on some of the progress that was made, but which was perhaps partial uh, in its in its implementation. Yes, I mean I think there are there, there are a couple of things. So we've done we've done a, a bit of research over the last couple of years to look at um, barriers to engaging in the skill system, and um, one of the things that we found there is that while well, the lifetime skills guarantee is really really welcome step and we've seen some progress this year so offering subsidized training at level three um, to people that don't hold a qualification at that level extending that this year to people who aren't currently earning the equivalent of, of, of minimum wage as a sort of annual salary i believe that's a very positive step but you know we, we, we ran some modeling in it and there are quite a lot of people who could stand to benefit from access to a qualification at that level if you, you didn't if, if you think that you did an equivalent of an a-level several years ago um and you're now having a rethink we've talked a lot today about re-evaluating decisions about how we want to work and what we want to do we want to we want people to be able to at that point in time decide okay i'm going to take up some training in a slightly different area or build on the skills I already have. But if you have a prerequisite there that you've already, if, you, if you've got an existing qualification at that level, you can't take part. We're ruling out lots of people that could stand to benefit from it. The other thing is that what, what we're doing there is subsidizing the qualification, but we're not offering a kind of route to access it. So we know that if you're somebody on a very low income, then costs of accessing um, uh, training and education can be prohibitive. There's those indirect, indirect costs, whether it's childcare or travel to take part in training, um, whether it, or just your subsistence. You know, if you've not got uh, another source of income, a partner, uh, someone to support you to get by. Our benefit system at the moment currently has some really rigid rules around the time that you've got to spend searching for work, applying for a job. And for some people, that just means it's not possible to, to take part in education or training while you are in that kind of intensive work search group. 
we ran some interviews this summer and even heard from somebody who was trying to take part in a course and was having to sit at the back of her college class furiously applying away to jobs so that she'd have a few to demonstrate to her work coach and that's that's just not a good use of anybody's time um so there's a bit there about how we can break down barriers to taking part in training um alongside that i'd i'd, I'd uh, and so that, that's about indirect costs and then subsistence support. We've seen moves towards a loan system um, where you know, kind of potentially mirroring what we have with higher education, looking to offer loans to take part in, in FE. I'd be really quite concerned about that just because you know, we know that people on lower incomes are going to be quite risk averse. If you're already on a low income salary, taking part in training, it might be about trying to increase your earnings. It might be about trying to get into a career that offers you more flexibility. So the trade-offs there aren't always going to be about having a higher salary at the end of it. It might just be about getting you to an outcome that is a job you enjoy more, that fits better with your lifestyle. Um, so offering a kind of a loan entitlement, which is, is which is what's being kind of proposed at the moment, would still mean that some of the people that could stand to benefit most from training might not feel able to, to take it up. So it's those two things I'd, I'd focus on in particular. That's really helpful, Mel. I'm, I'm conscious that we've probably got about 10 minutes of the conversation left to go. Um, there, there is absolutely no chance that I'm going to get through all of the questions that you have, you've submitted. Um, so apologies in advance about that. But what I do want to just try and pick up on is a couple of the questions that we've got, which are essentially, I think, pointing towards the statement that we can expect from the Chancellor at the end uh, of the month now. I believe it's been, it, it has been sort of confirmed that it's been brought forward which will essentially lay out the ground for public spending cuts, we believe, um, to try and balance uh, some of the uh, market turmoil that we saw uh, at the mini budget. And so I suppose one question that I had for, for, for all of you really um, is thinking about whether the kind of government's overall prospectus, as it were, around driving growth is, is the right one to try and meet some of these labour market challenges that we have. So I suppose one could summarise it as, you know, tax cuts, both for individuals as well as as well as organisations around corporation tax. Obviously, we know about the kind of reversal of the national insurance. We've we've had a bunch of investment incentives put in place. But as I say, we're also now talking about public spending cuts and there's still prevarication around whether welfare um, benefits are going to be uprated in line with inflation or not, although it seems the mood music is now towards the fact that they, that they will be. Tom, maybe I'll come to you first. Does it? I mean, I think I can imagine what your response to this is going to be. But do you feel like the government is, is sort of getting closer to being in the right direction to actually grapple with these challenges, or do we still have a mismatch? Uh, I think they're going, in many ways, in the completely opposite direction. I mean, I think I don't really think many people believe that kind of like somehow creating incentives for. For, for wealth creators is going to be the thing that, that drives growth at the moment. I think if, if you were serious about this, you'd be taking a long, hard look at the inactivity figures because that's the most, you know, short of reopening kind of immigration routes, that's going to be the, the, the most obvious way of kind of adding supply to the labour market. But also I just think all the mood, all the mood music around this stuff has been about <sighs> returning to some of the really old tropes about, you know, Benefits shouldn't be higher, you know, shouldn't increase higher than faster than wages are increasing. And let's, you know, make more restrictions on what people need to do in order to retain their benefits and all this sort of stuff. And I just think it's completely the wrong direction. I think coming back to some of the stuff Mel was talking about there, about how you kind of support and and foster and incentivize someone to kind of engage with the process of thinking about what other work they might be able to do returning to work. These are really kind of difficult processes for people to go through, especially when they've been out of work for a long time. And the last thing you want to do is create instability in their life. So people are, I spoke to when I went to visit food banks at the end of last year for some research I did with JRF and the Independent Food Aid Network. Loads of those people used to work uh, in, in good jobs and they'd often developed um, health conditions or other things gone on in their lives it kind of been a shock to the system. They'd fallen out of work and they'd really struggled to get back on their feet again. And all of them were saying, if I could just see past the next few days, the next week, I might have, I might be able to think about, you know, what training might be available, what employment support might be available. But none of those people could see past the next few days or the next week because they're constantly just, just in the battle to make ends meet. So the idea that like, 
you know, precarity and insecurity is a way of kind of incentivizing people back into work. I, I, I think it works for barely anyone, but least of all people with um, health conditions and least of all within that group, people with mental health problems who are the kind of big growth group within within this uh, population of people who are inactive. So I'd plead with them to change direction and think about how do you foster an environment where people feel sufficiently safe and secure to do things which are quite big steps and feel like quite big risks and how do you make that as easy as possible for people to do and none of it's to do with you know the incentive of having to pay less tax once you you know once you're on a you know forty thousand pound salary which is you know it's just fantasy absolutely and certainly a lot of what you said there tom would be supported by research we've done at the work foundation too Kate, just on on one particular point that was raised in in the q a um are you do you have a sense from from sort of your members or in interactions with employers that things like the new investment zones or the cuts to the corporation tax are making employers think differently about their recruitment and retention of, of staff heading into what could be quite a, a challenging economic period so, so what we definitely have a, a sense of is that um, a support for growth and a growth agenda, that, that's something that businesses can get behind. And they, um, you know, that's that's exactly what businesses want to do. And they and they want support in, in order to be able to um, uh, get through uh, what has been a, such a difficult um I suppose 24 months plus now so we've been up and down in terms of the crisis cash flow is a, a is at an all-time low uh for for businesses so any form of support where you so yes it is good that um the corporation tax level will remain static it that that's just a, that's a, just a massive sigh of relief for for a lot of businesses out there but I, but I don't believe it then it adds to the growth agenda and and to to Tom's point about you know if you're making it a stick to to go out to work um and to to get more hours that that sense of that's that's how people are being treated that is also bad for businesses business don't want to be the stick that they oh yeah you have to come and work for us as the employer because your benefits uh, sanctions are such that we you're being made to no business wants to to be in that situation that's that's not the sort of, that's not the sort of employer they want to be or associated with um far far more important to to businesses and good businesses is that they are seen to be really thinking through their retention strategies first and foremost it's how do i retain my people what am i doing to really understand the situations that they are in and 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 actually there is a huge amount of people that are in work claiming benefits that are having to um, having to work but still are not getting paid enough and and for many employers it's a case of that this is the this is the wage level that this type of role commands unfortunately it doesn't keep pace with cost of living and and I, I know so many businesses that that find that deeply upsetting that in order to keep their costs they can't necessarily in keep pace with inflation it it hurts them. It hurts them as much as it hurts their staff. And it's not. So um, so I don't think there's a sense of businesses um, feeling that they are um, they want to be part of a sanctions regime whatsoever. That's not supportive. Um, what we do want is we want a real big picture look at some of this. So you can do you can do some short term things. So businesses pay many businesses pay into an apprenticeship levy just some flexibility in that system will allow us to to train more people we just know it and it does so it's not just on that 12 month apprenticeship in a particular sector that we know that that money is sat there and it's not going it's not being used effectively long term big picture where's that where's the big vision for our workforce strategy how do you get businesses to buy into that how is it bringing all the things we said at the beginning how is it bringing together the issues that we have around burnout around health concerns nhs waiting lists around um returners programs the infrastructure being in place there's a the bit we haven't mentioned is transport some people need that help because they they don't have a car they can't get to where the jobs are and our transport isn't good enough so it, there's a there's a huge piece of joining this all together and joining the dots thanks kate um 
So we've got about five minutes left now. Um, before we kind of get into kind of final question territory, we do also have a question from Helen Parrott, who's asked around a gender dimension um, to, I think, um, the insecurity points that you were making at, at the start of the session, Mel. What I can quickly say, um, Helen, is there absolutely is, yes. And we've got some new research coming out about this uh, in the next week or so. Um, one of the kind of top line findings is if you're a, a woman, you're almost twice as likely than a man to be in severely insecure work. Um, so do keep an eye out on our social media channels on our website uh, for more on that piece of research coming up. But it absolutely there is a gendered aspect um, to insecure work in uh, in the UK. So with, with only just a couple of minutes left, what I'd quite like to do is, is sort of close out with a, with a sort of final question for each of each of our speakers, really. Um, and that is within 60 seconds give or take, if you could sort of let um, our audience know what the one thing is that you think the government should prioritise trying to get done between now and the next general election, accepting that some of the things we're talking about, if not all of them, have long-term solutions, but where should the kind of immediate priority focus uh, be? And Mel, I'll come to you first. This is something that's come up a little bit in the Q&A and a little bit early on, but uh, I think warrants more attention in this discussion, flexibility. The, this, the Conservative government, when it was elected in 2019, was elected with a manifesto that said we want to make uh, flexibility the default. Um, and if we do truly have cross, a kind of a cross-party consensus on that, then let's make it happen. Um, it, it, it's lower cost. We know that lots of employers already support it, but making flexibility a day one right with uh, employers required to advertise the types of flexibility that are available in a role and kind of only make the case where there's an exception. We could see a real shift with people being able, having a much wider menu of options to choose from and hopefully not see people being kind of pushed into those more insecure forms of work where they need that flexibility, as we've been hearing about today. Brilliant. Kate, I'll come to you next. Flexibility is key. Um, I'll, I'll stick with the apprenticeship levy. I think it's a really simple thing. You've got a pot of money there that's going unused. When we last looked at the data, recruitment agencies that had a, over £100 million that was unspent because they couldn't use it um, because you have too many people that will not be um, suitable to go into an apprenticeship programme. We've got lots of jobs out there which don't need an apprenticeship to complete, but a short term bit of training, somebody could do that job far more effectively. So let's use the money we have. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. And Tom? So in terms of the issues that I've been focusing on around kind of poor health and, and inactivity, I keep it really simple and say like damage limitation don't make people, more people live in poverty. And because... <laughs> You know, lots of people are falling behind and struggling to make ends meet, and it's bad for their health and it's bad for their prospects of moving back into work. So they just get the very basics right. So certainly uprate benefits in line with inflation as an absolute minimum. But, but start to seriously think about is kind of poverty rate benefits the best way to support someone to find the kind of stability and confidence and security to take the sort of steps they'd need to take to move from being out of work for a long time with poor health to thinking about making a big change in their life and returning to work. Fantastic. That's a great challenge to uh, to end on, Tom. Uh, so I think that just about brings us to a close in terms of the conversation this afternoon. I'd like to say a really big thank you to all of our uh, panelists for their contributions, including Linda Yo, who unfortunately couldn't be with us, um, and to all of you for attending, and of course the Work Foundation team uh, as well, who lead on producing our analysis uh, on the ONS data, but also in terms of putting sessions like this uh, together as well. We're going to be continuing working on these issues. We've got more research coming out, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on gender and insecurity, uh, as well as various other of the issues that we picked up on today. So please do um, keep checking back on our social media channels and website. Uh, and uh, we'll be back for the next instalment of this event series on the 15th of November. So please do look out for details uh, on that. For now though, I hope you've all found the conversation uh, helpful uh, and the discussion valuable and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.